so this is the panel for uh, LGBTQ plus rep in historical settings. Um, I'm going to let you all introduce yourself, starting with Paulette. Hi, I'm Paulette Kennedy. I am the author of Party with Ale, which came out this past November um, from Lake Union. And I write historical fiction, um, and it's mostly mostly Gothic in nature. Um, I do tend to focus a lot on the Gothic genre. And I also include um, LGBTQIA plus representation in all of my fiction. And my next book will be out this December from Lake Union as well. And it is called The Witch of Ten Mountain. Excellent. Uh, Quilful? Hi, I am Quiffle, as you said, and I'm actually a Patreon writer. So the way that I release my works is on a quarterly basis currently. And the more patrons I get, the more often I release work. Uh, this one is actually a futuristic piece, but I do a lot of work with the history for fantasy works. And I also include LGBTQ rep in all of my works. So it's it's always fun and I encourage more, more patrons to engage. And I have my works free for... The people who aren't in a place where they can support my work because I just love to share stories and have that community. Excellent. Um, Michael. Michael G. Williams. I write uh, science fiction, horror, and urban fantasy, all of which is always around queer themes and has queer protagonists and mostly queer casts. And uh, the week after this conference airs and happens, then the sequel to this book uh, called New Life in Autumn will come out. It's a far future science fiction detective story instead of historical, but it's also kind of a neo-noir feel to it. So it's got some of that historical flavor. And then I also have a series that is historical urban, fic uh, urban fantasy set in San Francisco that's time travel based urban fantasy called uh, the first book of which is called Through the Doors of Oblivion. And it's about modern day queer witches summoning the spirit of Emperor Norton into the future in order to help them fight a demon of real estate in the past. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, I usually like to start off with a bit of a, uh, I guess, lighter, easier question, but a lot of the ones we've got today are, I guess, quite dense. Um, <laughs> so I think to kind of set the tone, um, I'd like to ask openly to everyone who would like to answer, uh, how do you include different LGBTQ plus representation in settings or cultures where those groups are generally discriminated against? So honestly, I would say that the biggest thing when you're talking about different LGBTQ representation in settings in history, is the terminology and context, because these are the things that are most typically different from our modern eras. And as always with historical fiction, sometimes you'd have to take some creative liberties to kind of help bridge the gap between textbook and fiction in the sense of you're not trying to necessarily recreate it down to the perfect accuracy, but make it so that your modern day readers can understand this historic context without detracting from the immersive experience of a story. So while not every historic fiction novel can point out the fact that gay as a term didn't mean homosexual as an example, it's something that can be incorporated and certainly should be applauded when it is because that's something that it wasn't a term. Uh, typically the terminology for people who were homosexual in any capacity was usually defined in the context of a crime. So they didn't have the words to describe themselves. And that's something that is a unique experience for those, those historic periods. And they might have come across other cultures that had terms, but not every single one of them did. And I think that's where I usually start with when I'm talking about representation and including things in my works that are historically based is I want to understand how they would be received depending on the, the contexts of where they live and what lives they have. I mean, obviously uh, an actor who's alive in the time of Shakespeare is going to have a very different experience than a noble in Victorian times, like as far as what they can do and how they navigate. and. I mean, there's kings throughout history that had male lovers as an example, but they were kings. So 
they had a lot more sway and influence and they could do these things. So I think that's really where I start with is like the, the full context of what I'm working with and the terminology that I would use. I'll let, feel free to go first or go ahead, go second, go next. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, first of all, when I'm approaching a story and I know that I'm going to include queer characters in that story, I try to be mindful uh, toward not perpetuating harmful stereotypes, first of all, um, and to also realistically portray people as they live without being anachronistic, but also being realistic and also inclusive of culture and also employing um, sensitivity and expert readers um, who identify outside of my own particular identity within the spectrum. Because I think that a lot of times, you know, when you do identify within the queer spectrum, um, sometimes it gives you a little bit of a pass to write about other identities. But at the same time, it's like, I want to be accurate and want to be mindful of what those identities might experience that would be different than what I experience. And so um, I, I always make sure that I employ uh, sensitivity readers uh, while I'm drafting. And my publisher is really good about that as well. Um, like in Parting the Veil, I had a non-binary uh, character, a uh, gender fluid character. And so uh, we had a sensitivity reader specifically for that character. And so that's really important to me. And also like as in a historical context, like Pofel was mentioning, you know, uh, queer people have existed on a continuum all throughout history. And I think not including them, um, while it's certainly all right, and you know, that's your choice as an author, I think including them in a mindful way and in a sensitive way is very, um, I think it's a noble thing to do and it's an important thing to do because I think especially in historical fiction and and I'm speaking about all marginalized groups in general historical fiction tends to at least in the past have been incredibly whitewashed and incredibly not inclusive and so anything that we can do um, and when we're writing outside of our own experience to employ those sensitivity readers and those expert readers to help inform our writing I think that is really something that we can utilize to bring our fiction to a place to where we have that understanding and we're conveying what we want to say without doing harm. I feel like the whitewashing of historical fiction is, it's such a cheap ploy to say to a, a, a really sizable segment of the potential market for a book, hey, you were there. And nobody else was. You don't need to worry about anybody else. You were there. And we're not going to talk about people who were not like you. And I want my books to talk. Well, I kind of want to do the same thing. I want my books to talk to the queer people who are reading them and say, we were there too. You know, um, I think that the first task that I have when I write historical fiction is to remind people that despite the discrimination that existed in this culture, in those cultures around that time, we still existed. We existed regardless of what other people thought of us. And we still exist regardless of what other people think of us. But it's also really important to me when I'm doing that, I'm, I'll include the sorts of like anxieties and resentments and concerns that those queer characters had or would have had if they were real people in that historical setting. But I do not, or at least I only very selectively will include or depict the discrimination against them that they would experience because Active discrimination, like actively being marginalized, is not entertainment. Uh, my marginalization did not happen so that somebody else could get their kicks from reading it, and nobody else's marginalization happened so that I could exploit it to make a buck on any book. Yeah, and that's just that's a very important thing to me. I will happily show those people standing up for themselves. I'll show them creating their own spaces. I'll show them creating their own support networks in the absence of the society around them being willing to provide that. I'll show their empowerment in the face of the discrimination and prejudice that they are experiencing in that setting. But I will not just bash some queers to make some people feel good and get a chuckle or whatever. You know, that's, yeah. that's not entertainment, that is not fun. That's not what I want to write. Even the most 
like sympathetic version of that is ultimately a ploy for cheap pity. It's somebody who's not us saying to other people who are not us, oh, look at how pathetic the queer characters are. And that does not do us any favors. That does not make us any more equal. That does not empower any of us. All it does is tell queer readers that they are less than. This is one of those things that I hear a lot of discourse about. And I will say that I think in fiction, it's it's an escape. So if you try to make it too real to life in the, I mean, these are people who are being traumatized and marginalized and prejudiced against in their real lives. So I think there is definitely a, a real need to not hash that out in fiction too, where it's like, these people are trying to find an escape. Our people are trying to find an escape and feel safe in a world where where the rules have been set that they can't be hurt in that way. Now I know there are queer writers who use this as catharsis and they have very heavy subjects in their book, but I also know that these creators have always been very conscious of trigger warnings tags so that the only people that these things are reaching are the other people who will find it cathartic to say I am seen my pain is heard my pain is validated Uh, and that I think is a very small percentage and that's okay with me it's the people who like you said are exploiting that pain who aren't in the community who are depicting it in such a way it is more offensive than it is anything it's it's honestly the difference between like the women's rights vibe in um Captain Marvel versus like Shang-Chi where it's like they tried so hard in Captain Marvel it came across as chintzy, fake, and offensive versus like with Shang-Chi when you have two women in the same room they talk about their struggles being women and being seen and understood as women. You can tell the difference between something that's coming from a cathartic accepting place and an exploitative profit-based place. And unfortunately, I think that's the majority when it is included. So I would think it, I'm long form agreeing with you. (laughs) Yeah, I I agree as well. And I think that the not centering of queer trauma is really important. Um, If we can show uh, queer joy and and the sense of uh, community and the acceptance that we experience in our circles of friends and our found families and, and such, I think that's an important part too. And it's an important part of representation. Um, and like in Parting the Veil, one of the things that I get commented on a lot in reviews is it's just, it's queer people are just existing, doing normal things. And they, other people enjoy that type of representation. It doesn't always have to be about pain and trauma and anything that would cause some kind of, I think a distorted viewpoint sometimes, even though those things are very much a part of our reality. Um, they don't have to be the focus. Exactly. We deserve to be happy and powerful and all the things we want to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For a long time, anytime that, you know, when I was you know, approximately 7 million years ago when I was in college, uh, <laughs> if I heard that a movie or a TV show or a book or anything like that was going to have any degree of queer content, then my sort of cynical Gen X or take on it was, oh, I wonder if it's about us getting disowned or about us dying. Because it's going to be one of them, you know, yeah. uh, and I think that 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 pointing out that like we have always existed and we have always sought to to have lives worth living, you know, we've all always had a reason to get up in the morning, <laughs> or we wouldn't have, and and telling stories where that is totally absent is just like deeply offends me. It's it's soul crushing, really. It's like even the times that I've thought about like different like i'm ace so if i had been ace in history i would i'm a woman i would have to marry i would have to have kids so like this is something that ace people have done obviously throughout history and men and women and anyone on the spectrum have done these things and they've managed they've lived happy lives maybe they weren't thrilled but it's like these are things that we've existed and lived through and even found happiness during. So I think that's, that's worth mentioning. Yes. Um, I'm going to introduce, I guess, the next question slash topic. Uh, and we've touched on this uh, somewhat briefly already, but if you're writing a queer character in a historical context, how would you 
approach the idea that their conceptualization of uh, sexuality and gender might be different than our current one that we have right now? Honestly, I love these kinds of questions. It's it's super fun for me because gender and the expectations around it and orientation were just so different in history. Granted, most of my experience on this is British and American history. Uh, I have done some dabbling in other cultures, but not enough that I would feel confident enough to speak on it. So for me, it's it's things like men were expected to wear makeup and heels and those massive wigs and the concept of friendship and bonds like that were totally different. One of my favorite terms in history is bedfellow because it was something you could apply to anyone and it was someone you were completely comfortable sharing a bed with very confident they wouldn't murder you in the night <laughs> this is so like it wasn't it's like the sharing a bed trope except anyone could do it and didn't necessarily have a romantic connotation so i think there's something important to mention with with history and lgbtq rep to acknowledge that the depth of a platonic bond was also much deeper as people hadn't yet gotten around to sexualizing every single act you could hold someone's hand and it wasn't because you wanted to do the do you simply wanted to hold their hands it's it was something that you could hug you could sit on each other's laps i mean there are pictures in history that were like oh you know, they, they had to be gay. And it's like, if they're kissing, almost certainly, yes. <laughs> but if they're holding hands or hugging your clothes, like, no, our, they could have been friends. Uh, of course, they could have also been more than friends. We just don't know. And that's the historic context for me, where it's like, we have gotten so used to relationship escalators that if you have any sort of physical intimacy with someone, you have to have romantic feelings for them that it's erasing friendship from the radar. And I think that's important for me to mention as well as an ace person, because there are bonds out there that aren't necessarily, they can be physical, but they aren't sexual. And there's like a, a margin of that that was actually more present in history than it is today. So it's, it's a very interesting context for me for representing how they're, con like how they would be conceived and how society would see them because you could do these things and be gay lovers, queer lovers, or be friends. And you could be queer and friends or queer. Like there's a whole room for this because the conceptions around them were less defined. They didn't have these boxes set up yet. So they weren't putting people in them. And that's, that's kind of the joy and beauty of queer representation in history is that anyone can interpret it any way that they want. And we were still there. All of us were there. It was just in those blurred lines, you can't really define one way or the other, which means all of us can see ourselves in history in a strange way, if that makes sense. It's like peak inclusivity. Absolutely. And we were kind of chatting before we actually started the recording about heterosexuality as a term was really only put forth for cisgender male female relationships in the 19th century toward like the end of the 19th century. And so I, I really feel like gender and sexuality, they're constantly evolving, they're constructs, they're concepts. And so where each individual person fits into that spectrum is also something that's subject to evolution. Like I identify completely differently now in my late forties than I identified as a teenager. And so it's one of those things that like throughout history, like you touched upon so full, like in like the 17th century and, and Louis the 14th court, uh, women and men, like their mode of dress and, and the way they presented themselves outwardly were very similar. Like uh, men wore the long periwigs, they wore high heels, they wore rouge, they wore beauty spots and such. And so a lot of this idea of, uh, boys wear blue and girls wear pink and that uh, it's fairly modern. Um, and so it's, it's changed a lot. Like if we went back in time and like you were mentioning platonic friendships, uh, women, especially in the Victorian era had very romantic friendships with one another. They sent one another Valentine's, they held hands in public, they kissed. Um, and those were all acceptable modes of expression in public. Um, and so some, might have identified as lesbians. Others might have been happily married with husbands and children and such. And 
there was a lot of closeting that went on as well. But I think that platonic friendships, the way that we express ourselves in platonic friendships has changed a lot too over the centuries. And there's room for all, all sorts of different modes of expression within platonic and romantic friendships and relationships. And I think you see that throughout history, even going way back like to biblical times with uh, David and Jonathan, for example, mm -hmm. you know, very close, very like loving male bond. And I think so much of our identity um, and just sexual identity in history, like there's toxic masculinity kind of comes into play too, because oh, yeah. I think it's normal for men, uh, male identifying people to want those close bonds with other male identifying people. And why shouldn't they? But exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be romantic. And so it's just, there, there are just so many different modes within the spectrum and it's very fluid you know yeah it's beautiful yeah. seeing all that expression it is. i i think that people who read historical fiction people who seek out historical fiction they are sort of asking they're implicitly extending an invitation to say show me how the world was different and show me how the world was the same and so they're looking for a wedge to get driven by the story between their reality and the reality of the world so that they can sort of step out of their preconceived notions, their own assumptions that they, like any of us, have, have come to the story with from the world in which we live. And they're saying, I want to have these differences pointed out. I want to find out what are my preconceived notions that I didn't even realize are just completely arbitrary. And, it, and they kind of want to get there by having the totally arbitrary preconceived notions of the historical setting pointed out to them. And so I think that it's totally okay to just sort of like, you don't have to totally go into like, as you know, I am your uncle levels of exposition, but like <laughs> to have the characters talk to each other about these preconceptions, to have those preconceived notions, have the characters come up against these preconceived notions so that the reader has the opportunity to sort of vicariously bounce off of them also. I think that the readers of historical fiction and particularly readers of historical fiction that features queer, queer characters, queer stories, queer themes, queer experiences, they want to get a little shaken out of the world that they are like the rest of us sort of trapped in daily and, uh, and get to like learn about a historical setting and by virtue of that learn about their own contemporary lives. It goes a long way toward establishing empathy too. Yes. You know? And that's so important. Empathy and showcasing the spectrum. There's just so much, so much to explore there that I think you're absolutely right, Michael, is just challenging the things that are from our time and our preconceived notions in our cultures. It's mm -hmm. all while getting a story too. I mean, what, what can we say? <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, if the more that they look at that world of whatever setting we're talking about and say, gosh, that's weird. The, the closer they are to learning something exactly. <laughs> about the world that we live in, you know. Um, I'm gonna ask a question and I feel like I know what some of the responses this gonna, uh, to this is gonna be. Uh, given the conversation we had in the lobby before we began. Um, are there any instances of our perception of LGBTQ people in history being treated differently than they were? I are you looking for like specific instances or are you just saying generally? I guess, yeah, if you have any like interesting uh, instances of where our perception is wrong, um, uh, but also in a more general sense, you know, how would you address conceptions being wrong when writing something? I think a lot of it misses on some of the historic context that isn't as important now. Uh, and that's, I think one of the easier examples for me would be still like Shakespeare's era where uh, there was strangely not as much stigma on like sexual appetites and drives uh in the sense that like pleasuring yourself if you will was considered standard and it was fine to talk about it wasn't considered inappropriate it was just something that was 
a thing. Uh, and offenses typically had to do more with class. The social stigmas were to do with standing. And for example, like if you were in a play, if you were an actor, it, you were considered a disgrace, not because of any perception of you as like a person or orientation it was occasionally you would be dressing as someone who was well above your station which was considered deeply deeply offensive and it was from that that further stigmas arose uh, specifically with like male actors were the standard so there was a ton of cross-dressing going on because you had young male actors or effeminate male actors playing women and then the stigma came out from these depictions being above their station that they must be prostitutes it didn't start off with like oh he wears makeup he must be a prostitute no it started off with the social offense first of being above their station and daring to put on these clothes that are reserved for nobility i mean literally they were being thrown out of the aristocracy's places and that's how these actors were getting them so it was, it was considered very, very offensive, but on a social class front. And these are the, the kind of nuanced moments that we don't necessarily know as like casual readers or casual consumers of media. It's something that you wouldn't necessarily be aware of. And a grant, granted, again, the accusations of prostitution may not have been wrong in every single case, but it was born of a social class issue first. So like, that's kind of, it's, it's an LGBTQ situation in that obviously there would be people in there who enjoyed dressing up as women. There would be people who did this specifically because it brings them joy and they could have been trans, they could have been gender fluid, they could have been bi, they could have been, we just don't know because these words didn't exist, but they were still there and in any capacity that, in any of those capacities on that spectrum of gender or orientation. Absolutely. And, and you hit on what I was going to talk about too, as well, Coco. like if you're already in a stigmatized community, um, it's much easier to express yourself if you're already stigmatized. So I think that's why you see like queer culture having more of a presence and being represented more traditionally in the arts community first. And like you have theater and you have uh, Sarah Waters touches on this and um, tipping the velvet, you know, you've had uh, women who were cross-dressing as men and they were called toms and they would uh, get on stage and they would impersonate men and they had the white tie on and you know very dapper and there are several pictures from the era of women dressed and in and, and drag and absolutely stunning pictures and so anytime someone says oh that's not realistic I'm like okay let me show you a few pictures from the era and so I think that that's uh, kind of something that is misunderstood maybe a bit and uh, you touched on theater as well like earlier theater like a lot of the male all, a lot of the sopranos and opera were, were men dressed as women they unfortunately a lot of them were castrated um to keep yeah. their high voices and this kind of has a, a basis in the the church and such and so there's kind nice. of like a stigma to that and yeah some trauma affecting that as well but like just in general in the arts um I, I really feel like there's a little bit more of a an acceptance and so you see a lot more outward perhaps um expression of uh what we would call like gender fluidity and and, and such things nowadays exactly yeah I feel like you know <laughs> I think my answer to it is probably every uh, historical setting misrepresents queer characters to some degree or another, in mm. part because there are gonna be nuances to what queer culture was and how queerness was expressed in those times that are just never gonna be available to us, uh, no matter how much research we do. There's just gonna be stories and experiences that never got written down, never got recorded, never got preserved for us to be able to draw from. So there's gonna be stuff that's missing there, but I think, regardless also of which era, there is just, again, this assumption that queerness is always anguish. And there was, I'm certain, <laughs> plenty of anguish and queerness in any time period, including today for plenty of people. Mm -hmm. But there's also always joy. There's always something that they're making for themselves to, you know, create a space for their own experience. And, I, you know, a, a specific time period for me that I've always wanted to write in and 
I have like my I've told my publisher that I have a whole series of this that one day I'll get to. You know, when I get to the end of my current con contractual obligations, then it'll be approximately 2072. But uh, you know, one day I'm going to pitch basically a queer thin man meets Scooby Doo kind of like paranormal investigators set in the 20s kind of story. I and, am so here for that. <laughs> and, and like I, yeah. I love reading the history of queer culture in the United States in that time period because during prohibition the only people who would fund a gay bar were the mob and so there's a ton of like interconnected really complicated history and that continued for decades to the point that the Stonewall Inn was a mob owned bar you know that was half the problem that they had with the police was that the police were on the take and knew that they could squeeze the Stonewall in anytime they felt like because it was a mafia outfit. So there's such a complicated relationship there between like what we think of as a deeply oppressive and exploitative organization and people who only could turn to that organization in order to create spaces for freedom. And that's just something that we don't stop and think about. We make this really dangerous mistake. And I think that, that the last few years have certainly taught us that it's a dangerous mistake. And as we record this, this week has taught us that it's a dangerous mistake to assume that progress is linear and ever increasing and that nothing will ever get yanked back, that there's no roller coaster to the queer experience or to society in general in terms of the progress that marginalized people are trying to make to get a little bit bigger slice of the pie. And I think that, you know, we, we just assume that if things for identity acts are good now or better now, then they must have been uniformly worse the farther back we go. And we've got a real challenge that we have to rise to as storytellers to like find the ways in which those time periods were actually in some ways better for some of our people and in some ways much worse and in some ways just totally different in ways that we can't conceive of would never occur to us and I just think that's such an important part of getting it right there's a way in which the queer experience now is totally different depending on who you know, like what person we are speaking of, regardless of, of where they are in the queer communities, it, you know, whether they have one or multiple spots on the sort of the map of queerness. And it's, I feel like it's very important to recognize that that is just as true across any slice of time, any setting, any culture. We're never gonna pin down the queer experience. We can only tell like a queer experience and they're gonna be so different. There's gonna be so much about it that we, we, if we get it wrong, we are doing them a disservice. And if we get it right, there's gonna be somebody now whose experience maps onto that in some way that they will really connect with and we'll be doing them a real service. And I think that's also like generally important to mention as you're saying, like any time, any slice of life. And it's true because if you pick any era, there's going to be a way for, there's no such thing as like a character who can't be queer. That doesn't make any sense. Like even if they're closeted, even if they can't express it, they are still queer. And the, how you would navigate that would just depend on your standing. Are you, your position in life? And, but you're still going to navigate it. You're still going to get there where it's like, if you are, if you have a high social rank, you're going to be able to use your influence to mask it if it's something that you need to mask. I mean, it's something that could just be an open secret. You know, it could be you are not of high standing and you use your invisibility in society to go unnoticed. It's you can be in, like you were saying with the mafia, uh, pirates and Vikings have also in history been extremely like not i wouldn't say safe necessarily because of the calling you know the whole nature of the situation yeah <laughs> like they have been invited inviting places for women for queer people for yeah. anyone on the spectrum because there was just there just wasn't as much oppression of that sort in those societies i mean vikings yeah. had courts before other cultures even got close and just because they're associated with pillaging and plundering, people didn't see a lot of the civilization that was behind that, that created space for people who were being othered by their current culture, by their current society. So there's, there's a way for any character in any context at any time to be queer. And it really doesn't matter how harsh the treatment of queer characters in a given setting would have been 
yeah. because there are always people, there are people now and there have always been people for whom conditions have been sufficiently bad, for whom their marginalization has been sufficiently extreme, that the only way out is three, you know? Yeah. And so in the same way that there were people who would have said, fine, if the only life in which I will ever feel any sense of freedom is to go become a pirate, and they went and became a pirate, you know, that's that's just the way it is. There are a lot of people, it's, it's how we got gay ghettos, you know, in, in real history, where people said, if the only way I'm gonna have a life is to go move to the Castro or go move to Greenwich Village or whatever, go hang out on Christopher Street all the time, then that's what they did. Telling people that they are monsters and that monsters live in that part of the forest just guarantees that a certain number of those people are gonna go move to that part of the forest. I have a whole series of vampire novels about a guy who in the forties said explicitly, I am so tired of being told that I'm a monster that I'm gonna show y'all what a monster is and becomes a vampire just to, just to say to people, you think that this is bad? I'll show you bad. <laughs> and I think that there's, yeah, there's always going to be people who, in no matter what time or setting, who say to themselves, I will go where I can find my own, no matter what that is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's a good point to mention, that, like, um, even with someone who has like a higher standing, a lot of people can't wrap their minds around it. But my favorite, one of my favorite Ptolemies from the Ptolemaic dy dynasty in Egypt was Ptolemy the seventh, because there was literally only one thing in history about him. And is that as soon as he became in charge as soon as they made him pharaoh he was like nope and just pieced out completely it was like hard pass and just disappeared no record of him after that so you have no idea why he did that you have no clue i mean you can have you have a hunch Ptolemaic dynasty wasn't exactly steady but like you can speculate and there are people who would be rather who would rather give up being a pharaoh or a prince or an emperor or any sort of high leadership position to do literally anything else and it could be a case of i want to find my own and i'm not gonna find it here where i have a high risk of being murdered <laughs> like just because of my station and it's not even something that's me it's just the thing i was born to and i would rather not these this isn't even my place this isn't my people this is not where i belong so there's there's a lot of potential um I'd like to touch on something uh, that, Michael, you talked about a bit there. Uh, you said uh, some people, I guess, think that the further back you look in history, um, I guess, rights and understanding of queer people just gets linear, linearly worse. Um, and I'd like to ask, and this is to everyone, uh, what's your thought on the idea that uh, treating queer people equally in fiction is unrealistic oh i just stifled a laugh so that's probably a good <laughs> indication <laughs> i was like probably not a great time to laugh but then i was like it, it's not it wasn't as intense like pre-19th 20th century it wasn't it wasn't like this rampant hatred it was something that you just kind of that was just sort of part of it and you treated it in some cultures, it was considered like bunny years, like childlike, a phase you would grow out of. It was something you explored in your teenage years and you would move past it. I know a lot of East Asian cultures were slash R like that. And there have been many other cultural mov movements like that, but it wasn't considered like a, a violent offense. It wasn't something that would evoke rage in people or hatred. It was just something like, oh, you never... You never outgrew this thing. And it, so in some contexts, yes, but it's not like they were treated unequally in that sense in all cases, in all time periods. It, it wasn't linearly worse in, in that sense of like, it was considered part of your life. It would be unusual almost if you hadn't at some point. So it was like almost an expectation in that sense so was, was it equal treatment i mean i mean no obviously not like you didn't have mayoral rights you know it would be kind of weird in that context for like most cultures that i know of you would be considered an outlier if you even tried you would probably not be allowed to but the actual romance of one another uh queer representation the, the spectrum had a lot more 
room to exist, even if it was still in the margins and it wasn't as much of a grounds for unequal treatment as it was in recent centuries, in a sense, if, if, that, if that makes sense. <laughs> I think a lot of it too has uh, has to do with media, you know, the prevalence of media and news and, and hearing more about these stories. And I think Michael and I are probably around the same age. I'm a Gen Xer as well. And, you know, we were the generation that saw Matthew Shepard. We were the generation that saw a lot of things happen to queer people. Um, and so showing things equally, like a lot of us did a lot of masking you know, in our younger years and such for safety reasons. And I, I don't want to emphasize the trauma and the anguish, definitely not. But I think when it comes to portraying um, people in the culture equally, I think that there are some misconceptions like the modern era versus like earlier times. I think that because of the prevalence of media, we hear more about certain things. And so it doesn't mean that they were less prevalent back in the older days and that there was equal there wasn't equal representation. I just don't think it was necessarily as talked about um, in certain eras. And so um, with a lot of like Victorian, which is the era that I've done the most study on, um, there were more quiet type relationships and especially among women and, and men as well, especially like, you know, in the UK, it was, it was illegal. Like it was highly illegal. Like you could be killed for uh, being homosexual if you were a man, you know, in the Victorian era. And so there are a lot of incidents where things perhaps look a little bit skewed. And that was the, just because of the level of safety and the level of um, just what society considered permissible to express. Excellent points, honestly, because the time period does really define it. Yeah, I think that, like, especially if what you're writing is going to be considered historical fiction, then, then it is just by necessity, it's going to be depicting a world where there was some form of marginalization of queer people, no matter what era it is, whether it's 200 years ago or yesterday. And, uh, you know, I think a story about queer people now has to acknowledge that there has been such huge right-wing backlash against queer progress, against mm -hmm. so many different identities in the queer communities. And, uh, and it has to acknowledge sort of like generational trauma of people who, we are very similar ages, I think, and uh, people who came out queer during the 80s and watched you know, their friends worry deeply, at best, worry deeply about their long-term prospects. And uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's I think you have to be realistic about the setting in order for people to buy into it as historical fiction. At the same time, I am concerned anytime anybody insists that there needs to be more marginalization of queer people on the page to get it right. I think they're telling me something about themselves. You know, if they're the person who is outside of the queer community and is insisting on that, it, again, it really depends on who's making the point on who's telling the story. If it's someone within the queer community wanting to make sure that the queer experience is accurately represented, that is one thing and good. And if it's somebody outside the queer communities who is saying, I just wanna make sure that queer people suffer on the page for my entertainment. Well, that's not good, you know? And, yeah. uh, and it really comes down to like, why do they want to see this? Are they making sure that this is included in the story in order to tell the story of our communities? Or are they making sure that this is in the story because they find it entertaining? You know, and I think that there are a lot of people who think of themselves as good allies from outside um, by insisting on that sort of like realism. But I don't know that I would trust myself to accurately depict somebody else's, an experience that somebody else has had that is in no way familiar to me and uh, especially of discrimination and marginalization. And so I'm not sure that I trust those people either to sort of like set boundaries around our stories. I think another important part of it is these are made up stories. To some degree, we get to tell what we want. So <laughs> I mean, we, you know, 
there's a point at which we have to start explicitly acknowledging it as fantasy rather than as historical fiction. But you know, there is historical fantasy also, and uh, and I think that my personal preference is always to like, much like you said, Paulette, like look for the ways that there are boundaries around what these people can get away with in their life, and like look for the ways that they create those quiet joys for themselves, so that we don't get caught up in assuming that it was always bad. I, you know, I don't know. I just, uh, everybody has always, every generation of queer people has faced something different. And I think that it, it would be doing them a disservice to pretend that was not the case. And we would be doing them a disservice by not presenting, you know, what kept them fighting the whole time too. And I, I do like that it's the mention here that inequality was different with every time period, with every generation, because in Victorian eras, you had to be quiet, but I'm looping back again to the Shakespearean era because I don't have a problem. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite plays of his is actually Othello. I have not read some of his more major ones. Somehow I managed to avoid Hamlet. Uh, anywho, the uh, it was not intentional. It just happened. But with Othello on stage at one point, Iago professes his loyalty to Othello literally in the framework of a marital vow of the time. The amount of times that Shakespeare had by and queer rep on stage is just staggering to me when I was finding it out because I was like, I can't imagine that that would have worked in like a film in the 80s. You probably would have been in a lot of trouble. And he was like endorsed by nobles who like were going to the plays like excellent. Yes, I am barely closeted. Like I don't think this was so like inequality looks different in the sense that like there were quiet times of it and that where you had to keep it very hidden. And then there were other times like in a completely different scene in Othello, he literally Iago lying to Othello, like a little jerk, but <laughs> told him that he was sleeping next to one of the soldiers in the tent and that he says specifically, he kissed me hard as if he plucked kisses up by the roots that grew upon my lips. These are two men kissing on stick. He describes it like that. I mean, that is like, this man was going for it. Like, so there was like very unabashed queer commentary in the sense of like he didn't have to go that hard he could have just said he kissed me weird hated that like no this man was like going into like he kissed me deeply <laughs> like there was a poetic imagery to it so it's the inequality looked different in different time periods so while it was always present I don't think it was something that was necessarily as criminalized in center stage in every single era. And I think that's kind of where it got me to laugh in the beginning where it was like, is it unrealistic? And I'm like, not exactly because you have these characters on stage doing this play over and over and over and over again, talking with marital vows practically between two men and these, these poetic depictions. And this is just Othello. This happens in a bunch of his plays and it happens with other creators as well. So the inequality looked different, but there were some ways that you were able to be more open with that affection and queer representation in mainstream media for the time i mean this was william shakespeare so even if he was not necessarily socially as accepted and lauded as he is now it was still a lot so it was something that you wouldn't have necessarily been able to get away with in other generations in other cultural periods in other locations so the inequality looks different Right. I'm going to move to a slightly lighter question uh, to finish on because that was that was a heavy one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask if there are any time periods that you really enjoy seeing queer representation in uh, and that kind of, I guess, can just be a bit, you know, a bit more fun uh, and interesting. That is a really good question. So I have two answers that don't seem like they would be fun time periods, <laughs> but I think they are. They're like my favorites. So uh, one of those is the late fifties, early sixties, what I think of as sort of the eve of Stonewall where you've got, you know, you've got the Mattachine Society, you've got the homophile movement. Activism is very, very small. Like public activism is very, very small, but it has started and like queer anger is really simmering. And I feel like there's a lot of story to be told 
and that sort of emotional context. I feel like there's a lot to talk about there about like why people are angry and also about how queer joy is resistance, which is actually a panel this weekend in this conference that I was on. But like, it's such a great phrase. I've decided to just totally steal that panel title for the purpose of this answer, because like, talking about the way that queer joy is resistance and queer resistance is a form of joy, you know, that it can be joyful, that it can feel so good to like break the bonds. Um, it, I feel like there's so much fun to be had talking about people who can tell deep in their bones that the times are just about to change, that like something big is about to break and they are right there in the heart of it. And it just, that's so great to me. And then another of my favorite time periods is early 80s queer existence, where the story is not automatically an AIDS story, but it is the story of people who are sort of like looking around the corner from the sexual liberation of the 70s and saying like, what is tomorrow going to hold? You know, these, these are people who as activists, like they were dreaming big early. They were anticipating changes and hoping for and working for political changes that would not come for 20 or 30 years and in some ways would be delayed because of AIDS. But uh, I love that that moment for them. Um, I have a short story that I wrote one time about a guy who is an out gay guy working in retail in the mall in the early 80s and one of his co-workers is his first straight friend. And, and just like how weird it is for him to just like have a straight friend who just doesn't care, you know? And, uh, and he doesn't stop and think about it in terms of like how generous this is of his straight friend or anything like that. He's just like, it's such a relief to get to experience, like not always having to worry that this person is about to go after me for this, about to attack me or, or, or say something mean or whatever. And that feeling of relief of like, oh, just coming up for air, I think really can be set in that very specific time period in a way that I think that's a lot of fun. That's something that we all kind of hope for. We, every iteration, again, every generation of queer people has in some way felt like they either just came up for air or just about to. And I feel like talking about those moments in queer history is really powerful. I think for me, um, being a gothic novelist, uh, my favorite era is the romantic era. And I think there is just so much fodder there just to explore just, a, you, you know, you have Polidori, you have Shelley, you have Byron, you have all of these larger than life people who were queer, you know, and who moved in those circles and society and Bo Brummel, you know, all of these. I think after the French Revolution and the American Revolution, you see like this brief surge of time where people felt this immense freedom of expression. And like up until Victoria's reign, you kind of saw that, like it started in the Regency and like going up into the 1830s, that's when we had Anne Lister, that's when we had people who were living, who were kind of pushing against those societal, like the, the state conventions of the 18th century. And so you have a big movement and there's just so much joy there um, and creative joy and artistic joy. And you see the pre raphaelite movement and you see people expressing themselves in lots of different ways. And the undertones are all there. They're all there if you're looking for them. Dracula, like we're, we're seeing, like even though Dracula was later, but like Frankenstein, uh, you know, it's all there and it's just amazing to like read Byron's poetry and I think Byron sometimes um, when actors and such portray him they portray him a little bit too much you know um, he, he actually you know there were a lot of things about him that were a little bit probably not as campy as what he's portrayed but he was also you know he wasn't afraid to take some chances and it was like kind of a well-known secret you know that that he was on the queer spectrum. And, you know, people were by and large okay with that, as opposed to when you get to Oscar Wilde in the Victorian era, where it was decidedly not okay. And so even just within the span of a hundred years, there's a lot of fluctuation within when we talk about the equality and such. And I just feel like that whole romantic era is just a joyful time um, for people 
who identified as queer? I would say for me personally, uh, I am in the, I know it's kind of hard to describe it. Uh, I am in the like Victorian England, you know, bleaker times group in the sense that I love a bright light in the dark almost. Like I go to these darker spots because I admire the strength and resolve it took for these people to get through these times so much. And it's like, that's what really draws me to it. It's like, there's all sorts of these joyous times and bright times. And as much as I love Shakespeare's era for being able to do things like that and other eras like the romantic period where you got to see this openness, this presence, I just am always drawn moth to the flame to these moments where it was hard and the chips were down and people were actively seeking to do harm to the queer community and anyone in it and still we persisted and still we found that strength and there's an inspiration in it to me that I just I could never let go which I probably is a little strange because I'm a millennial I'm a 90s kid so it was one of those things where it was like you didn't have to hide you didn't uh, the generation before us fought for us so that we I I don't even know Matthew Shepard uh never heard of him until this moment, uh, there's a lot of the, the struggles that I didn't see, but it's almost because I didn't see it and I didn't have to experience it, that there's just a deep respect and affection for it. And I always go back to it where it's like, thank you for doing the things that I never had to or shouldn't have to. We'll see. We'll, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'll add your point about the century and how much changed it immediately made me think that there is basically exactly a century between Oscar Wilde and, and Matthew Shepard. That's never really occurred to me, but like, gosh, that was quite a hundred years there. And it makes you wonder what the next hundred after Matthew Shepard will hold. Um, but wow, I loved also what you said about the romantic era and, and like a place, a time and place when people could like be really joyful it really makes me want to go back and reread Dracula, which I recently heard somebody describe as uh, daddy issues forever, like literally <laughs> immortal daddy issues. And, uh, and it's my favorite novel of all time. So I've only read it, you know, 10 or 15 times, but every time I read it, I'm always like, hmm. Yeah, and Paul Castle was, you know, influenced by a lot. So yeah, Dr. Totally. Paul Adori, yes, yes. <laughs> it's good to know that Castlevania is doing great justice to daddy issues forever. Yes. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, from the Gothic, you know, just in general, it's just inherently queer. Like it's oh yeah, oh my there. gosh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Carmilla. I mean, <laughs> like, right? yeah. goth times were like, yeah. would you like barely repressed sexuality? <laughs> And I mean, even Frankenstein, to some degree, Dr. Frankenstein couldn't find a man good enough. He made him one for himself. You know? Right. And then he was an awful father, right? Seriously, yeah. the worst. Like, yeah. It was so yeah. weird to be like, Frankenstein's monster. I don't see any monster here but Frankenstein. Exactly. One of my friends Boom. has an excellent book um, told from the perspective of the, the women in Victor Frankenstein's life that's coming out this fall, and I'm super excited for it. Oh, you should really send good. me that Ooh. link later for yeah. reasons. That sounds yeah. like so good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Like, are we going to make fun of Unnatural Creatures? Chris Walder. Yes. What's it called? <laughs> Unnatural Creatures is by Chris Walder. It's even a genius title. Like, right. Oh, that looks so bad. I want to read it. It's so okay. good. I've read it early. It's excellent. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It sounds so good. Right. right. I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about your current projects uh, before we leave off for the evening. Um, I'll go ahead and go first, I guess. Yeah. That, that <laughs> okay. works, that works. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, um, well, I, my next project is uh, The Witch of Ten Mountain, and I have another project that I'm working on right now, but I can't really talk about it too much because it hasn't sold yet, so we're kind of in that, that space. Um, but this novel, The Witch of Ten Mountain, is based in the Ozarks, and it, it's very um, much kind of about the culture of the Ozarks and how this family of hereditary witches fits into this culture, and there's lots of sapphic vibes, and it's really 
um, kind of an exploration of that. So that's kind of the next thing I have coming down the pipeline. My next book, which again, is, this is the weekend of uh, Ray Hive. Um, then my next book, my, my next book comes out like Tuesday or something. It comes out the 14th of June and it's a sequel to A Fallen Autumn. It's a far future science fiction detective neo-noir kind of thing. It is exceptionally queer. Uh, it's queer enough that that bothered some people in the first one, which just makes me feel like I've done it right. Oh, and so I, my current work, exactly, my two current works in progress as of this moment are the fourth book in my Emperor Norton time travel queer urban fantasy series set in San Francisco, which will be called uh, The Last Scene of a Strange Career. And then uh, the first book in that series is called Through the Doors of Oblivion. And I'm also at the moment working on a, an, an Appalachian set ghost story slash cosmic horror novel about generational trauma and what having really messed up families does to one person and what it's like to inherit the old farmstead when it's just haunted as hell. And, uh, <laughs> and that is called Our Contemporary Ancestors. I love it. I love all of this. Uh, I'm writing down stories as we go here. Uh, Honestly, for this quarter, for me, uh, it will have published by the time Right Hive comes around and be free to read for the public. I'm working on the next story segment for Where Ages Meet. Uh, it is a historic fantasy. I'm. It's a story about mages on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. So they're in the process of being outmoded. And it's a prospecting mage Oliver who drags his carriage driver Rick into it at the last second of course a carriage driver he was being outmoded too with cars so it's kind of this common ground on where they're both being outmoded and they are both extremely gay I am trying to figure out whether or not they're gay for each other they are making it as difficult for me as they possibly can <laughs> but honestly uh one of the one of the more and more favorite stories uh it does have some small followings so honestly i'm just happy my patrons and my readers on twitter voted for it so i'm super excited to to release that i may or may not have written like four chapters when i was intending to write one it's no one's business um <laughs> so that's that's where i'm at excellent um again thank you all for being here uh i think this is definitely um an interesting panel, a lot of uh, important points of discussion that we've had here. Um, yeah, uh, thank you all and good evening.